Hey guys, welcome to the fifth installment of the Noetic Podcast on Augustine's Free Choice of the Will. Uh, I am your host, Luke Johnson, with my co-host, Jordan Klein. Salway te, everybody. <laughs> and I think we, uh, reviewing the, the tape from last week, I think we did a really good job of discussing the interconnectivity of reason, virtue, the will, how it's distinguished from inordinate desire and all of that. Um, and the major question that I think we're going to have to deal with today as we um, transition out of book one and into book two is a question that Evodius puts to Augustine about how God is ultimately not accountable for the evil that's in the world. And uh, Evodius structures a question sort of like this, and in that if, if God created these beings that can choose evil and can sin and can give in to inordinate desire, ought not the evil be be on God? Why didn't God create beings that were, he could just wind them up like little um, toys and they just go about and doing his divine duty? Why does, why does he even give them the option to sin? The fact that God gives them the option to sin is going to make, look bad on God somehow. So is that kind of how you understand that this book gets started? Is there anything that you would add to Avodius's question to Augustine, have I covered it all on that? Uh, yeah, you covered it pretty well. I'd say a, a big aspect of it is justice. Uh, so from the perspective of Augustine, it's that God is just uh, and free will is bound up in justice. And since God is good, justice is good, therefore free will is a good thing. And, uh, and then Evodius, yeah, and then he brings up that to, question. I'm, well, see, I want to back you up there a little bit, because okay. I think I think we need to, we haven't talked a lot about justice so far. And, and I think I have to ask you what you mean by justice. And I think that's a very difficult right. question. I mean, when, yeah. I, when I started my PhD, <laughs> yeah. one of the things that we would do to confound each other and whatever is we would ask each other to define justice. And then we sort of came up with this, uh, this sort of hackneyed answer where we would just be like to give each his due but how do you understand justice so far uh, yeah. in, in Augustine because there's going to be a justice that we enact towards ourselves and mm -hmm. there's going to be a justice that's sort of enacted cosmically and I think you probably need to dwell on that distinction a little bit in order for mm -hmm. Augustine to properly respond to Evodius Right, and I think a lot of it has to do with, like, merit, you know what I mean? So, like, and reward and punishment. That's kind of the duality that I see in my mind of even, you know, just, like, day-to-day -day things um, or, you know, in, especially in this text, I mean, it's mostly, like, just, like, divine and, like, the cosmic of justice is, you know, uh, God rewarding people who are upright with happiness and then people who are governed by their excess desires with unhappiness and sort of miserable lives and they're just slaves to desire. And right. So this is the, stuff. so I, from what I understand of Augustine, I think what he says here at the beginning of book two is something to the effect that if God had not created beings with a will that could decide between loving reason or giving into inordinate desire, then the good of an upstanding virtuous person that experiences the felicity of engaging in, in virtue would never come to be. Right. If we're going to acknowledge that that's a good, right, mm -hmm. and that that's going to be sort of an extension of this eternal law or God's justice or whatever, if we're going to say that's a good, like, that's why God created the free will. The free will right. was to create something really wonderful in the world. Um, and it's, it's not that God gave us the free will to sin. God gave us the free will so we could enjoy the participation in reason. Right? right? So, so, so yeah, what, what actually, does Avodius say to that explanation of Augustine? I mean, do, right. It's so, a really beautiful sentiment, right? Right. And actually, I'm really glad that you brought that up because here's a, a quotation that I wanted to introduce in the podcast. And because it made me, you know, it was a very thought-provoking uh, passage. No action would be either a sin or a good deed if it were not performed by the will. And so punishment and reward would be unjust if human beings had no free will. So, so that kind of, yeah, that led me to the question, can you go through life just being a perfectly neutral person? You know, well, could, that, could there be anyone that just kind of like a meh existence? I, you know, do no harm, but do no good either? Yeah, I thought about that on the way over here because because uh, 
to prep for our meetings, I have to go back and listen to my own lecture series. <laughs> and so I was listening to myself. I was teaching myself with myself. I just feel like the I... The ultimate narcissist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what this is all about, right? Um, just loot the Luke echo chamber. But um, something that Avodia says is that, okay, fine, you know, Let's say that God imbued us with a free will so that you could participate in reason. Could God have not constrained the individual in such a way that they could only choose reason, that they wouldn't right. be able to choose inordinate desire? And, and that got me thinking about this predicament that you're talking about, about individuals that live a neutral and meh existence. So let, let's, let's tease that out a little bit because I'm still talking about internal reward right. and, and, and demerit and stuff like that. And there's going to be the external reward and demerit, which is going to be other, the other aspect mm -hmm. of, of God's justice and why God needed to give people free will, which is a totally <laughs> yeah. incredible idea it's of Augustine. Awesome. Yeah, it like, is an awesome Way idea. to go, Augustine. <laughs> so let's see if we can... I want to dwell on that for a little bit because honestly, I think we could talk about this for 40 minutes. Absolutely. So Avodius Easily. says, why couldn't we? God just have made human beings that didn't choose evil, but only choose the good. Right, sort of like well, the application of justice, right? Like, you cannot screw up justice. Like, why wouldn't God make something kind of almost like idiot-proof? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, so, kind of like God being the ultimate minority report situation, right? Like, pre-crime, like intervening before we could do something. So, what, what would be potentially problematic? And I'm not sure it is, but Augustine says that it is potentially problematic and paradoxical if we had individuals who could not, who could still choose choose reason, but couldn't give in to inordinate desire, so let's, so what what's it? We we tend to like food examples. You like yeah. the food examples, all right? So, yeah, sure. Let's go with that. All right. So you so you're going back to our sleeve of Girl Scout cookies or whatever, and right. like like just the inordinate desire for you to eat five thousand calories worth of cookies in one mm -hmm. sitting isn't ever presented itself here you you uh, your reason is automatically sort of delimiting you so that you can't engage in the vice of gluttony what is potentially philosophically problematic about all of that i mean it's like it doesn't really provide like an actual like i don't know, I want to say almost like a measurement or like a standard of, of goodness i mean that's the thing is like it's not necessarily like an, like can a you, reward if you don't merit it you know what i mean how can you be how can God bestow a reward if you don't really do anything to merit it? Right. If, if there's you're not, just, yeah. If you're if you're not truly faced with the stress of giving in to inordinate desire, can you actually experience the felicity of having overcome it and and merit? Right. Exactly. Like that idea if, that you're sort of forged by ordeal. You right. know, it's, if you never have that sort of ordeal or or trial, you know, how do you receive? Uh, you know, like a reward for doing the right thing in such a situation. So God couldn't, so just to extend that out, if, if we weren't tested by inordinate desire all the time and our will could just so easily migrate over to reason, would it be the case that God could really create upstanding and virtuous beings? They, or would it just be sort of automatic that they do the right thing? Yeah, I think it would just be like that, almost like a yeah, an automatic and automated process, which definitely, I don't know, it would it would dilute the meaning, right, of upright action if it was it was just automatic and like there was absolutely no agency in it. Well, th which goes back to the point I want that you brought up earlier about whether or not you if it is automatic because it's not completely automatic. It is possible to not make the choice, like so trying to think about it in the context of our particular example here but if we had if we were able to give in to inordinate desire and to sin you could eat all the samosas is that what they're called or samoans maybe, yeah. or, or samoa or samosas i like thin mints personally so th or thin mints thin that's mints. my jam uh, if you could eat all the thin mints you wanted you can give in to the gluttonous desire but if you take that away and really is you is your only option to 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 limit yourself to three of them or right. is there like a yeah no like a almost like a selective sin like oh well i only had three like <laughs> you know can you like is that just making an excuse for yourself <laughs> you know what i mean like i only sinned a little bit 
I, it just seems like we could it's a go. Thing? Yeah, it just seems like we could make choices where we don't. It's not that we're necessarily actively choosing vicious sin in a lot of ways, but we may just be kind of. We seems like we would still have the option of not choosing, right? Like, right. Like, mm-hmm. like. So let's say we would. But what about the collateral damage for stuff? You know, like that's what I like. Kind of wonder. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that we may not go around murdering people or or becoming gluttonous or becoming mm-hmm. Lotharios or things like that, but we may still just sort of passively get by and not choose anything at all. Mm-hmm. Or would that passive not choosing be a symptom of some sort of inordinate desire as well? Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know, if you think about people, like, there's some people who just, like, hate arguments and will avoid confrontation at all costs. Yeah. You know, do you kind of, like, sell yourself out because you don't want to, like, ruffle feathers? You know, if you just keep your mouth shut all, the, like, all the time, is that sort of, like, compromising your own integrity in some way? Or are you just really diplomatic? Yeah. I mean, that seems to be the, pers- the person who would live the meh or neutral mm-hmm. existence. I, is, is that a problem? Yeah, I mean, like, that's the kind of, like, I wonder because, you know, in certain situations where you feel compelled to, like, speak up for someone or some group that might be marginalized or disenfranchised, you know, the sort of that that sentiment you say you sometimes can do uh, bad things by complete and utter inaction. Yeah. So, you know, it's like that idea of getting roped into evil if you see an evil act happening, but you don't do anything to intervene precisely so i think what you'd have to say is i think it wouldn't be possible to have this meh option because it seems like that would be some sort of that would be some that the the lack of conflict the lack of wanting to stand for something the lack to want to stick for something Mm -hmm. the lack of having conviction or whatever that would seem to stem from some sort of inordinate desire maybe just for desire for comfort yeah, or to, just even, I don't know, like, good status or, you know what I mean? Or something like, oh, well, they're they're always very level-headed and, you know, very diplomatic about things. Maybe it's like people want, like, their own a good reputation by staying out of things entirely. So I guess we've answered our question that, that if God had created beings that could not have inordinate desire and could only choose reason the will that it would be impossible for them to have neutral and meh existence because if they were choosing a me- right. neutral meh existence they would still be driven by inordinate desire to some degree yeah and so so and in that way there would be no choice and they would just be uh holy automatons mm-hmm. so and and because they're holy automatons they wouldn't go through the process of adversity to cultivate vir- there's no cultivation of virtue the right. will and reason are just automatically just like one in the same right they're just yeah on like the same same line yeah and and, and you you could almost say that there may not even be will right, or exactly. it may be indistinguishable would it di- from yeah reason. would it just like diminish it to such degree that it just like no longer you know exists like it's a nominal thing instead of actually being its own entity so this is going to be one of the reasons why Augustine is going to say that we that that it's ultimately a good thing that he even though humans can misapply the will and create evil in the world it's ultimately made to create beings that i get serve some greater good at least at the very least have some good going on within them Mm -hmm. but then you have to ask a bigger question about why is it so important on a cosmic scale for god to have a world with beings that can experience the felicity of virtue why is that significant? Why didn't God just let the world be all grasshoppers, right? It, if, it, is, the, is the risk too high to have beings that can feel the happiness associated with virtue if they can also commit vice? Why not just have all cows, you know? And this, think, this yeah, is going to be an idea. To, right. that, this is going to be yeah. an idea that develops throughout the whole thing because Augustine's going to start to paint the portrait of a cosmic order, right. which gets to this other thing about justice of which you've been speaking about, right. I, the external reward and demerit. And I think I've harped on the individualistic reward and demerit and why God would want us to have free will in that respect. <laughs> But I want to talk about this other aspect of justice that you've brought up too, unless you don't think we've covered it internally enough yet. 
Um, well, I think that, like, one thing to your point about why didn't he create a world for, like, full of, I don't know, grasshoppers or, or cows, I think it, we have to like, keep it, you know, within the context and remember that this is pretty much a medieval audience. So I think it speaks well of God to create these beings that he knows that he gives them the option, but then he doesn't completely obliterate us, right? You know, like, wipe us off the face of the earth if we do sin. Um, so I think it's kind of cool that it's like celebratory of God and keeping that kind of like medieval context in mind. But um, yeah, sorry, back to, back to justice though. Yeah, <laughs> so that was almost like a cool, that was just a, a cool um, aspect that I sure. really like at the text is that, you know, it's just, uh, since we live in such a secular world to sort of be reminded of uh, compassion, right? There is like a compassionate God and a God that, that loves us and that wants good things for us, and even better, he doesn't completely destroy us if we, you know, misuse or misapply his gifts that he gives us. Right, right. So, yeah, so God giving us free will... So it's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's not tangential at all, but the, the, God gives us free will, in a sense, as an extension of his love, right? Is that he wants right, us to experience... Right, exactly. That's how I saw it. It was a, a gift. So if it's a gift, then, uh, and if it's bound up in justice, then it has to be a good thing. It's just so difficult to see it as a gift when you see so many people use it for such heinous ends. Right. Like when you see people torture and murder people as a result of their own free will. But, so I think, so I think the question is now, and this is the, this is a really mind blowing sort of real, that, that really gets cultivated throughout this sort of Augustine text is that free will is given to us not just so that we can experience the happiness of virtuous activity, but free will, you mentioned this already, there's a, there, a, a grander, more cosmic sense. Augustine talks about the necessity for free will. And what was that? Do you, do you recall what that is? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's just... <laughs> you already, sort of, you already yeah. said it. I just want you repeat what you said earlier before I slowed you down yeah no I mean um sorry I've got kind of yeah, <laughs> we yeah. get all so off topic it's it's great um there's sometimes where I like you know lose my my train of thought sometimes well you know what what may seem off topic mm-hmm. to some is very on topic to me because if right. we don't address these details like we can just we just run roughshod over the text and I know I, I know I must sound repetitious and things like that but I really want to emphasize the importance of these ideas just as I'm going to emphasize the importance of this next idea Right. And I, I mean, it's, I think the, a big part of it is like this belief, right? I mean, with how free will, they, like they don't understand it, but they're making it a point to endeavor to understand free will. And I think that uh, a couple of things, one theme that stood out in particular is this idea of authority. I don't know if you remember in the text, but, you know, Augustine starts quizzing Avodius and he says, oh, well, you know, do you do you actually know this? Do you understand this? Or are you just accepting this as a point of fact because a bunch of people who are in a position of authority are telling mm. you this? And, and this being what I think... I, you may be a chapter ahead of me because I think I know where you're going as far as what Evodius is mm-hmm. pushing Augustine on. Specifically that, that free will works in this way and that, that there's a God that this free will is comes from, right? Right. So he's going to start so, to develop an argument for God. Right. So he's kind of saying, okay, so are we all on board with the fact that, you know, free will is good? And Navodi says, yeah, like I'm, I'm on board with this. Well, I want to go there. It's, I, yeah. I, I okay. have to slow all you right. down all again. Right. Okay. I have all to right. slow you. Oh, so excited. Okay. Okay. I, I, before we can go there, we have to talk about, um, we've talked about how uh, God's justice applies to the individual. And why the free will was essential for for God's justice to apply to the individual, but for a m- more cosmic scale, you talked about accountability. Maybe develop that idea a little bit. Yeah, I mean, God had to give right. us free will for accountability. What does that mean? Um, well, I mean, in terms of like you know the actual like if we go back to our sort of like bio sort of like yeah. scale of things, go there, right? girl. It's yeah. that accountability. Um, and a lot of that has to do with reason, right? So if the more reasonable and the more rational of being you are, the more accountable you are to God. So, you know, I mean, even things like, okay, like, let's take Lucifer, like Lucifer, for example, right? I mean, Lucifer is, like, 
you know, Satan, <laughs> because he was arguably like, closest to God, but he fell the furthest. And I think that it kind of has to do with like that accountability and the closeness to perfection. But those are my own opinions. But uh, like, what, what's your take on that? Well, what I'm trying to get at here is that if if we didn't have free will, it wouldn't be so. Not only could we not experience the felicity of a virtue, but that God couldn't adjudicate the worth of individuals right. and determine their their eternal destination. Right. So like, there would be individuals if if we didn't have free will. Things that we think of as being sort of patently unjust, like a murderer who gets away with it, or like, or a Nazi concentration camp guard or something like that, who's able to go hide out in Brazil and escapes the, the arms of the law or whatever. So long as there's free will or in this cosmic sense of justice or whatever, you can't un you can't you can't outrun God. Right. right? Exactly. Right. You, so like exactly. So like that's the sort of thing that. Um, you know, that we struggled with, uh, I think a few podcasts ago with this idea that of self-defense and that issue of, well, do you just let evil things happen to you and mm -hmm. just hope that, oh, well, I hope God will avenge it. And I think that uh, this uh, passage here gets closer to the point of saying yes. Yeah. So, so, so God can, because he has given free will, he can prosecute people long, long after their, their temporal life. But this exactly. raises a really interesting question that goes back to something I mentioned in terms of, in terms of okay, so, so cool. So free will allows for individuals to become virtuous. Free will allows for God to prosecute individuals, even if they should escape earthly judgment after they die. Evodius is going to say, or, or, or maybe Augustine preempts them or something like that, like, why is that important? Why is justice important? And it, it, it doesn't Augustine say something effective to the effect of, yes, it's important from the individual perspective to be virtuous, that we have a free will. Yes, it's important that God is able to judge people and stuff like that. But he almost says, like, if God didn't give individuals free will, where would God's justice go? Right, there'd be like almost like no expression or God, like no outlet for it. Exactly. If God right. didn't, what Augustine seems to be saying is if God would be muted and suppressed if he did not create beings that he could reward and punish. Right. And like, I think that again, like that kind of like goes back to like the, the aspect of like praising, like God is like so powerful. Like what's he going to do if he can't like exercise like his power and greatness to like the fullest extent that he possibly can. So and he's it, God, so he's going to. <laughs> is that? Are, tell me right? that's not a crazy idea. And crazy, I mean, like, tell me that's not like an, a mind blowing idea. Yeah, it's. <laughs> is that a mind blowing? Because that, <laughs> yeah. that struck me that essentially, okay, God had to create people in in order for him to 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 fully express himself. That's so cool. <laughs> That's right? crazy. To, yeah. to, to, to at least That's express great. the dimension of his justice. Yeah. And you could say that maybe I'm using the wrong words. Maybe God had to create people so he could fully express his ability to love as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe when I say justice, I should be saying that the love and justice are, are one and the same. Do you, do, you, do you sense anything problematic about that, though? Do you sense anything mm -hmm. prob? And, and Augustine doesn't really address it here, I don't think. But if God has to create people so that he can fully express his love and his justice, might we be running up against a, a paradox of sorts? Do you, do you get at what I'm hinting at here? I think a little bit, but I'm kind of being an Evodius today, so you're going to have to kind of like walk no, me okay. through this one a little bit. <laughs> well, what I'm getting at here is that you might one might be able to make the case that this might be doing violence to some of the divine attributes that god in some sense needs man right i, I don't and augustine's not trying to say something heretical but oh, it, implicitly god needs man to sort of validate him right like the only in a if, way. if if god doesn't have man how does god 
how does God express his justice right. and, how is and his love? Great, yeah, and how is his greatness acknowledged if there's no one to acknowledge it and celebrate it? it right. So it, um, it, makes, it makes it look like, so far with the way that uh, Augustine has devoted, developed the argument or whatever, that God might, his being might be predicated on his creation. And, wow. <laughs> right, right. Which is yeah. So, so Augustine has sort of gotten himself himself out of one corner with Avodius, but he may be getting himself trapped in another. Unless you can start talking about God and and the creation being in some sense indistinguishable, mm-hmm. so that then God is really only predicated on himself. So then, when we're talking about, it's really an illusion to talk about Jordan and Luke and God when really there's just God. And Augustine may be painting himself into this corner of this pantheistic sort of belief. And, I, and you may know better than I, it wasn't Augustine sort of evolved, involved in some early church fights about Gnosticism and different conceptions of the divine and how, oh, man. how mean, humanity relates to just, God. I mean, that just entire era was just, you know, I mean, Catholicism wasn't the dominant, uh, you know, Christian, I guess you could say like movement. So I mean, every, I mean everyone, everyone was just duking it out with everyone. I mean, there were just uh, people were like, you know, getting in street fights over this stuff. I mean, it was just a mess. Yeah, yeah. You uh, can see how you can have some really animated councils of Nicaea. Right, and this is the I, I think that like Augustine's just like he's very slick. He's he's clever because there's sometimes where he like pegs himself in these like corners, but then he'll just like completely sidestep. Yeah, it'll be interesting as, to as see how... As you go chapter to chapter, and then he'll just say, and eh, we're just going to change the subject on to this other thing. <laughs> it'll be interesting to see how he gets himself out of that one. I wanted to... Mm-hmm. I hope it, w- it wasn't too boring for you and everybody else for me to slow that down. But No, can, no, that, can, was, that was good, because that was that's a lot to like parse out and Those are out. huge ideas, right? Huge. Yeah, so, and so, so... Just to reiterate, we covered right. that, that, that the will exists for us to be virtuous and happy, that the will exists for God to apply his justice to yep. all of humanity. That God's, without, without human creation or, or whatever, God wouldn't be able to bestow his love and justice in a certain way. And then the further idea that God's being may be predicated on having other beings to apply these things to. Okay, that's why I had to slow you Ooh, down. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Thanks that, for doing that. That, 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 is, <laughs> yeah. that, is, that is insane. That's insane. Yeah. And it may mean that God is all, on this view, that it may mean that uh, a weird sort of Christian pantheist sort of view. But I'm not, we haven't gotten far enough in the text for me to say that that's what Augustine is or anything like that. I doubt he's going to make that claim. So yeah. I think we've covered a good bit of the first two chapters. Right. Now, now let's talk about the, the third and the fourth, unless you wanted to say more. Uh, yeah, no, I think that we kind of, we like scratch the surface on that like thankfully so thank you for putting the brakes on me i tend to get very enthusiastic <laughs> we're at 28 like, let's go let's go <laughs> i know i know what's coming in the next two chapters and we're at 28 minutes and i'm just like holy crap yeah we, if we spent 28 minutes on that stuff yeah. well, how much are we going to spend on this actually luckily and this is kind of how sometimes uh augustine can be very start stop start stop switch gears um he's really good at, at doing that because uh, now we ca- we're starting to get to the point uh kind of getting back to more of the discussion of sort of the animalistic stuff about uh we got you know existence life and understanding all right so help us help help people understand why augustine is making that transition and you said it already but just reiterate it i think i mean it has a lot to do with like you know the faculties of reasoning and the perception of free will essentially but he's going to see these things as interlocking towards a larger end right avodius avodius is going to acknowledge augustine okay fine Maybe you've shown me why a free will is a good thing, but he asks him, how do we know these things, right? Right, exactly. And he just says, okay, uh, you know, he asks, what, I think the three main questions are like, you got to help me out on this one. I know yeah. one of them is like, how do we know God's existence is manifest? And then, which one of the other two? It's, it's all kind of stemming from that, that there is a will. I, I'd have to go back and check my right, notes. Right, yeah. But I mean, because he still gonna, isn't totally convinced. He's like, okay, if all fine and good, but I'm not totally convinced that there's a God that would do all of this stuff. Right. If there is a God, I could see these being legitimate reasons for why he bestows free will, but we're still debating whether or not there's a God. Right. And what's interesting about what Augustine does in this move, right, is that he's not going to be like, do you see a chair? 
therefore God. He doesn't right. like do this like <laughs> yeah. he doesn't do this like right. kind of simplistic intelligent design stuff that is sort of characteristic of a lot of evangelical circles or whatever. He has a really he starts to de- develop a a proof for God in a weird way. And how do, how does he de- start to develop this proof for God? Yeah, and it, and it has a lot to do I think that where Augustine is really cool is that he creates like, these really awesome sort of like hierarchies within like hierarchies, you know, mm-hmm. and he kind of, and like, that's kind of a helpful way to like map things out. Right. Because it's really easy to get just drowned in these philosophical texts. Uh, so he points to uh, our reasoning for faculty and the fact that as human beings, we're able to understand that we like, we not just have reason, but we acknowledge our, you know, reasoning faculties that, because remember we, we talked about earlier how reason is like instrumental in free will. Mm-hmm. So he kind of starts to break everything down of different life forms and reason. Like right. We talked about. We, we talked about this hierarchy mm-hmm. before where we talked about, you know, we talked about an above and below man and him being sort of this mm-hmm. intermediate the position. Middling, right. And we talked man having reason, will, and, and desire as a result mm-hmm. of embodiment. We talked about animals having will and desire we talked about plants just having desire we talked about inanimate matter we talked about angels maybe 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 having (laughs) reason will and desire the only reason why we said they may have desires their ability to rebel we'll get to the angels later we'll just deal with terrestrial stuff but augustine's going to spend some time dwelling on the differences between so not he's going to spend some time dwelling on the differences between man and animals and the faculties that animals have. Right. And ultimately, he's going to be doing this in order to make the case for there being a god. So, okay. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> right. So, so, so are we? Okay, fine. We take that humans have reason or understanding or whatever you want to call it. Fine. But let's dwell on animals. What right. does he say animals have? We well, just take it for granted they have will and desire. But what else does he, he – he explores exactly what animals have right. a little bit more. And what is he, how does he talk right. so about So he animals? breaks it down uh, between existence, a li- a life, or knowing you're alive, and then understanding. So those are the three things that he deals with and uses that to sort of classify life that we know of. All right. So, so let's take a dog. Cool. Okay. Dogs, he, he's going to go even more than this knowing your life. He's going to break yeah. it down even more than that. Let's take a dog. Dogs have senses, right. just like humans have senses, mm-hmm. right? A dog can see, hear, touch, smell, and those senses can be more or less developed than our own, right? Right. So, uh, dogs can smell better than us, right? Oh yeah, like way are, I don't know how our vision. Is. How's our vision compared to dogs? I think we might have, it might like, depend on slightly... the species too. Yeah, I know that dogs like can detect movement really well, but I had this one dog and like, it really liked to chase my cat. And like the second that my cat like stood still, like my dog would have no idea where it was. So it's I think like... we might we might best dogs on site. Yeah. Um, but hearing. Keen, oh yeah, they have like different. Really, they have a yeah, different range of hearing. Different frequency. Mm-hmm. So. So they have different sen- – they, their senses are constituted differently than ours. But right. they have senses. Mm-hmm. We have senses. Okay? But he says that it's a different sort of thing. When you talk about sense, it's a different – like, I'm looking at you. Right? Right, yeah. But that's different from knowing that I'm looking at you. Right, exactly. So it's like this idea of like, like there's like that inner sense. Okay, so the the, okay, mentions. okay, okay. But I'm, I'm getting too far ahead. No, okay. so so there are the individualized senses that any organism has. Right. Right. Sight, smell, touch, taste, whatever. But what does Augustine say about those individualized senses? Right, and then there's some, are they individualized? There are some sen- like sort of uh, perceptions of things like uh, shape. Yeah. You know, he says that like there's something like that you can actually feel like you know like if you hold like a ball you can feel like the roundness and the smoothness with the touch but then you can also see it it's mixed so there are some things right that defy 
like just one classification. And what does he think that points to? And he points the two dun, 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 inner sense. He what says, I know, so what tell everybody what the what you it's, understand the oh gosh. And this is awesome, right? This is awesome. Right. It's like the main sense that governs everything else. So the inner sense takes the data from all the individualized senses and like synthesizes it. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, why do, why does he think that we have an inner sense? What if we didn't have an inner sense? Well, then, like, that's the thing. It's like he uses sight as an example and, like, detecting movement. And when you close your eyes, like, you know, you can't see anything, so you can't sense movement of other animals, good or threatening. And when – that's the thing. If you couldn't the words are escaping me. <laughs> yeah, if you couldn't <laughs> – if all the senses weren't tied together – the organism wouldn't be able to function and live, right? Like it, it would just be super disjointed. Like right. there would be absolutely no cohesion. Like you'd just be getting an input of stuff, and you couldn't make sense of it. If it saw the bear, but couldn't, if this, if a dog was able to see a bear but not associate the bear with the snarl, right? An intimidating snarl. It may try to go up to it and be like, "Hey, you're just a really big, friendly dog. Let's right. be friends." And yeah. the bear's like. How, yeah, you yeah, are, exactly. uh, like, you you're, are my dinner. You're a snack. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. my snack. But because there's this inner sense, the dog can come to some no in some sense. Uh, but that's into it. Maybe we should say into it. Yeah. So it has that aspect. But since animals don't have reason, Augustine is like very to the point. Then. Animals cannot understand, so they can't come to know things. All right, so so when a dog, with its eyes, can see a bear and associate through its ear that 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 it's intimidating and can be like right. run away, yeah. like I'm uh, out of here. <laughs> it its inner sense says run away, right. bad run away right and that's kind of like that dichotomy of you know fleeing towards things that are like life-giving and things that deal death flight or fight right yep, or some exactly. sort of evolutionary yep. premise or whatever yep. <laughs> so chasing after dinner or running becoming dinner <laughs> yeah, yeah away from being dinner. yeah so so the when the inner sense is synchronized like that and tell an animal to run away or to stay or whatever. Inform. Inform. Right. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not going to say that that is a form of knowing. Right. It's only what's coupled with reason that it becomes knowing. Yeah. So we only know things as a result of reason and animals can't know because they are devoid of reason, yet they have this inner sense. What do you think about yeah. that? I know, I know. When we st- first started talking yeah. about Augustine, you didn't like this because you felt like he, he he sold animals short. And I talk about it in my lectures some because, it, like, I think about my own dog, who, like, when I put on my tennis shoes, like, thinks we're gonna go for a run and like gets all excited or knows. Yeah, no, I think, I, it seems like yeah. my dog knows things. Right. I mean, like, I don't know, like. Like with my mom's dogs, for example, whenever you open the car door, they jump in because they just say, oh, oh boy, we're going for a ride. I love this. So, you know, they, they do develop an association with things. So and I uh, think that just, you know, I mean, I think that just is, we can chalk that up to just, you know, knowing a lot more about animal behavior and biology now. So are we going to say that all animal behavior is really going to be the result of this inner sense sort of pushing it around. I mean, is, is that, and, and, yeah. and I think in the last thing we talked about too, is that I sort of thought, I, I guess the question too, if animals have this inner sense that's adjudicating what they should do. And you know what? Not all animals are going to decide the same way, mm-hmm. right? This is kind of right. how like the survival of fittest is going to work is that some animals are going to see that bear and be like, let's be friends. And then they die. Or right. worse, oh, I can take that bear. <laughs> yeah, and so the, and the, and and evolution says this type of of instantiation of the species is no longer going to reproduce. So we have this transmission of the inner sense that leads to smarter dogs. Right. Right. I mean, this example is terrible because dogs are all a product of human right. engineering, <laughs> not evolution uh, in the proper domestication, sense. Domestication, but yeah, 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 yeah. But you know what I'm saying. But. Um, I think last podcast I was trying to illustrate why animals may have a will because they could sort of 
choose right, they're, between they're guided desires. by that inner sense. And I think that inner sense kind of helps them decide what inordinate desire to pursue. So, if that makes any sense. Yeah, what is, is so is the inner sense is the inner sense the will or is the inner sense dictating to the will? Like is the inner sense a collection of desires that the will listens to and then goes one way or the other? I guess it would yeah. have to be kind of like that and that's why it right. would account for why some animals go one way and other animals go the other way. Yeah, I think that that would be the most like sort of satisfactory answer, right? So what all right, so let's just say that's the answer. What do you think of what do you what do you what do you think about that? And and maybe we should because we're com- we're at 40 minutes Ooh, yeah. right now. Maybe we, I'm going to let you close it out. What do you think about Augustine's understanding of of senses, inner sense, knowing, not knowing? And animals do you what because I know this is a hot topic for you yeah I mean that's the thing like I mean I, I love animals and uh you know I think but there's also a tendency for me to you know give them too many human qualities uh, like of course you can sit with me on the sofa of course you can eat all my food uh yeah I'd say given the again like I'm sorry I'm so wedded to context but given the context like this is pretty advanced stuff you know yeah. what I mean like it's definitely scratching the surface of animal behavior you know like psychology you know and all that all that cool stuff. So, I mean, like, given the fact that this was, like, I don't know, towards the end of the Roman Empire, like, not bad. <laughs> and not I think bad. a lot of this has to do with, you know, Aristotelian thought on animals and sense perception and rationality and stuff like that. Because it's cool because the way that he sets it up is, like, you know, like, we're not really that much different from animals. We just have reason. But we're still, we still have that inner sense, I'm right? Just... Like, you know, like, when you're in the mall and, like, you smell Cinnabon, you know? Like, oh, yeah. And it just like hits you, and you're just like overwhelmed by it. <laughs> yeah, it's how like advertising works. And yeah, stuff. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm detecting a shift in your perspective. I noticed when we first started discussing the the Augustine, you you were so mad at Augustine <laughs> for reducing <laughs> animals to these beings that are just driven around by by an inner sense, and that they don't know things, and that they don't approximate humans enough. You seem to be the idea seems to be growing on you you seem yeah, more okay think, with the idea now yeah and i think this passage too i mean with uh the incorporation of reason i think it's kind of he grounds us a little bit again and saying well you know we have all these same things and qualities that animals have but we have reason to help inform us more so he kind of in my mind at least it kind of establishes a little bit of parody so he kind of does it in a way that I wouldn't have expected, but I think that's why I'm starting to warm up to it. Don't, or I'm brainwashed. <laughs> don't the, nu- the nuances kind of wash it? That's why yeah. it's important to really get into the details mm-hmm. of this stuff, is that uh, the, the, a lot of people said to me, like when I was first developing the noetic stuff, is like, why would you want to get so into the details in your lectures and all that? Like, why not? Why wouldn't people just want to mm-hmm. know like the broad landscape of the ideas? And I'll tell you, the, the deepest truths are in the details, you know? And, totally agree. Um, and, and I have found that, I, 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 have, I think I've found the most, the most, the things that sh- shift my own personal paradigms the most are things that are like consigned to a paragraph that everybody else overlooked. And I think that's kind of special about what the product that we're making here is that um, we're not taking shortcuts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like, they're just, like, so many, I think, really, like, it might seem trivial at first glance, but once you really start thinking about this stuff, it can really, like, resonate with you, and it really can kind of help shape your own worldview and how you see things. Yeah, like I think that's, <laughs> yeah, I would say this, out of the four lecture series I've done so far, I would say the Augustine text affected me the most positively. It, <clears throat> it, a lot of the other books that I've done have talked a lot about meaning. And this isn't a book explicitly about meaning, but right. because of the importance that he puts on certain human faculties and where humans fit within that cosmic hierarchy, it tends to make one's life seem more meaningful. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that it imparts a lot of meaning. It might not you know, scream, I'm meaningful, yeah. or, you know, anything like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, like, much more subtle delivery of it. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it, sure. it, defi- it definitely, it's one of those things that, like, um, whenever, I'm getting a little off topic, and I 
should bring it to a close, but like, have you ever gone through a period where you've studied a lot of theoretical physics or gotten, have you read any theoretical physics and you're like really into it? For oh God, a no. <laughs> uh, well, th- there've been periods in my life where I get really interested in it. Oh yeah, of and, course. Like most people. Sure. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, like, the, it, and the world starts to look like mathematical to me. Like I start to see, um, like grids and dotted lines and geometric figures like a wor- like 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 someone put a transparency on top of the world, you know. Mm-hmm, right. I, and I feel like this kind of has the same sort of effect. Like when I put when I l- take reality and I layer Augustine's transparency on top of it, I feel like I see a deeper reality. Yeah, I think it gives it kind of a richer lens to looking at yeah, things for yeah, sure. Yeah. I think he's good at that. All right. Cool. We left him with a cliffhanger. So we'll we'll, we'll pick it up uh, on chapter four of book two next time. All right, awesome. All right, see you guys.